So thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you this morning. Philippians is such a great book, and I've really enjoyed reading through all of the passages and all of the chapters. I know Philippians 4 is where we find ourselves today. It's the final chapter in this, in this book, and it's a pretty amazing chapter. And if you look at the first three verses of chapter 4, you find that you have two ladies who are in a disagreement, and they can't really see eye to eye on whatever's dividing them. And Paul, in these first three verses, he really encourages them to get together and to work it out before it becomes a bigger issue. Now, I'm not going to spend any time on those three verses because I want to go straight to verse 4. Verse 4, to me, is where the money is in this chapter. In verse 4, we find a very difficult idea. It's not really a difficult idea to, to say, but it's a very difficult idea to do. It's a very difficult idea to put into practice. It's a very difficult idea to put into practice in the way that you live your life. And this is what it says. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Now, sometimes when a command is repeated immediately for emphasis, you know that you need to stop and pay attention to what it's saying. It's a little bit like a few weeks ago or months ago when it was 3 a.m. in the morning and I'd just come off a string of night shifts and I couldn't get to sleep and I looked at my phone, opened my emails, and I saw an email from EB Games and the subject heading in big bold letters said Black Friday sale. And before I knew it, I'd added 10 games to my card and it equaled about $300. And I thought, maybe I should wake up my wife and ask her permission. But it would have been rude to do that, because she was asleep. So I bought them. And a few days later, I came home from work, and I see my wife sitting at the kitchen table with that look in her eyes. And there's a package opened next to her on the table. And she says to me, Harry, don't buy games from EB Games at 3 a.m. in the morning again. Are you listening? I said, don't buy those games at 3 a.m. in the morning again. And here we have a similar directive. but. As opposed to my story, which is fairly easy to follow if you want to stay sleeping in the bed, we're given a directive in Philippians 4, verse 4, that is a lot harder to, to do than to say. Rejoice in the Lord when? Always. And again, I say rejoice. It's a really cute and churchy idea. It's really sweet. It's the kind of thing that you'll print off and put on a mug or you put on a bumper sticker, you put on the back of your car, and people will look at it and go, wow, that's such a happy person. They're always rejoicing. But it's easy to say, it's easy to print off, it's easy to hang on your wall, but the outworkings of it are incredibly difficult. And I want to read a story. I want to read you a story. And this story comes from a series of Facebook posts written in the last week by a Ukrainian woman by the name of Nadia who used to live in the Ukrainian harbour town of Mariupol. Unfortunately, she escaped a few days ago, but these were the words that she was writing before she escaped. She said, I am sure I will die soon. It is a matter of a few days. In this city, everyone is constantly waiting for death. I just want it not to be too scary. When we ask the police what to do with our friend's dead grandmother, they advised us to put her on the balcony. I wonder how many balconies have dead bodies on them. Our home is the only one on our avenue without direct hits. It was hit twice by a shell. In some, apartment, in some apartments, windows were blown out. But our home did not suffer much compared to other homes. The whole yard is covered with layers of ash, glass, plastic, and metal fragments. I try not to look at the iron thing that flew into the playground. I think it's a rocket, or maybe it's a landmine. I don't care, it's just unpleasant. My dog starts howling, and I realize that they're going to shoot again. I'm standing outside in the daytime, and a cemetery silence fills the air around me. There are no cars, there's no voices, no children. There's no grandmothers on the benches. Even the wind is dead. I try to cry, but I cannot. I feel sorry for myself, my family, my husband, my neighbors, my friends. The people of Mariupol must live. Help them spread the word. Let everyone know that civilians continue to be killed. 
How do you rejoice then? Paul said to rejoice always. Always. And always includes when your home has been destroyed. It includes when your life is in danger. It, in it includes when you've just received that cancer diagnosis. And it includes when you've lost that loved one. And it always includes every moment of your life, whether good or bad, whether easy or hard. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Now we're going to need some help with this. This is really heavy. Thankfully, Paul goes on to explain his reasoning. If we read in verse 5, he wrote, Let your gentleness be known to all, to all men. Why? The Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. Now, is it worth rejoicing that the Lord is at hand? Or is it worth rejoicing always that the Lord is at hand? The answer to that depends. The question of if the Lord being at hand is something to rejoice about completely depends on what kind of God the Lord is. Is he a bit like a Zeus, a Zeus character, one of the most powerful gods in Greek mythology? A God who ordained the creation of humans that he could demand their worship, demand their sacrifices, impregnate their daughters, inflict plagues and pestilences. A God who valued humans only as much as his capacity to meddle in their lives. You didn't want a God like Zeus to be near. Or is the Lord a bit of a cosmic dictator, sovereign over all creation, under his might, the world must bow. He is powerful, you are not. There's no back and forth. There's no give and take. This God exists for their own sake. If you're suffering, it's by that God's decree. Is that, being, is that a being that's worth rejoicing when they're at hand? I would say not. And that the Lord that Paul has decided to rejoice in is markedly different to these characters. And in order to look at who this Lord character is, that Paul is so glad at hand, we need, to, we need to find out who was this Lord character to Paul at the time that he wrote Philippians 4. And importantly, how did he get to that point in his life? What experiences shaped his views? So how did he get there? Paul started off as a hot, up-and-coming learner of the Pharisaic code. He was of superior intellect. You didn't want to find yourself in a debate with Paul, really about anything, but especially about the law. If you walked into the debate room and you saw Paul standing at the podium, you just walked straight back out. There was no other option. If you wanted to get out of there alive, you, you just walked out of there. It was the easiest way. It was the best way. So he's an intelligent, dogmatic, zealous person, zealous for the law and zealous for his God. And... He's just living his life, but this movement known as the way breaks out. And it's centered on this character called Jesus of Nazareth. And this Jesus of, Naz of, of Nazareth person, he dies and is apparently raised from the dead. Now, Paul, he was very frustrated by this newest perversion of Judaism. And there had been many before that, but this one was incredibly bad. And he wasn't the only one who was frustrated. And so he goes along and he listens to one of the preachers of this message, a man by the name of Stephen, who was preaching and teaching this Christ crucified. And he wasn't the only person in the crowd. The entire crowd was burning with anger about this message alongside Stephen. And so they actually pick up stones and they throw them at Stephen because, after all, the best way to silence this kind of heresy is to kill the person who's, who's saying it. And it actually tells us in the book of Acts that the crowd took off their coats, maybe so that they could increase the, the speed of their throw. And they take their coats and they lay them at the feet of Paul, who the Bible tells us heartily approved of what had just happened. So I want to ask you, is Saul's picture of God at this point clear to everyone? He doesn't worship a God who's willing to spill his own blood. 
He worships a God who demands that the blood of others get spilled for his glory. He doesn't really worship a God that you could rejoice in at all times. But then something massive happens. Saul is traveling on the road to Damascus. He's hunting more Christians to kill them. And Jesus, the person who died and apparently risen risen from the dead, appears to Saul on the road. And he goes, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul, Saul, there's that repetition again. We need to pay attention to what's happening. He's saying, Saul, your view of God is horribly wrong. Saul, I'm not the way you think I am. And Saul is converted in Damascus. He's actually converted from being a hater of Jesus and his followers to one of them. But did he start immediately preaching about this new Jesus, this crucified Messiah? No. We're actually told that he goes back through his Bible and he relearns everything he'd gotten wrong in the first place. In Galatians 1, 15 to 17, it says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. There he is. He goes to Arabia. And what's he doing there? In Arabia, we have Mount Sinai, the place where God first revealed himself to the Jewish nation. The place where Elijah went to escape Jezebel when she was trying to kill him as well. And he goes to Sinai and he's retracing these these footsteps of his people. And he's retracing the footsteps of some of the major names in his ancestry. And he starts in Genesis, and he reads back through the entire Hebrew scriptures. He starts with the story of Noah's flood, where God promised to Noah that he would save him from the destruction of the waters that were to cover the entire world. And in this story, Noah builds a boat because he believes God, and the waters come. And They're left floating for quite a long period of time, and you might be tempted to think, has God forgotten about us? But then Paul finds the key verse in the center of the story. Genesis 8, verse 1, it says, And God remembered Noah, meaning God doesn't go back on his promises. And then he jumps ahead to the call of Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. And he goes to the story of when he was asked to sacrifice his own son Isaac to God. But the shock of the story comes in verse 8, where Abraham declares the gospel message without even realizing it. It says in verse 8, Abraham replied, talking to Isaac, God will provide himself as the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. There's the gospel message right there, and Abraham didn't even know it. And the implication being that God's not appeased by our sacrifices. He sacrifices himself for us instead. And then he skips ahead in time a few years. He's reading the prophet Habakkuk, who lived at a time just before the Jews were to be taken into captivity. And they're surrounded on all sides by enemies. The poor people are huddled there in fear. And Habakkuk declared of God in Habakkuk 2 verse 4, the just shall live by his faith or his faithfulness. Meaning, and this is from God's perspective, no, you are not to panic. You are not to be alarmed. I am at work, and I am bringing my purposes to pass. If you are to live, it will be because I am faithful. He's saying the one God has been true to his promises, and he will continue to be true to them. And then finally, Paul's just doing this aerial, well, he opens to Daniel 9, and this will be the the last example that I give. But really, there are so many others. But we just want to do an aerial view following the the journey that Paul took when he was doing this study. He opens to Daniel 9, the greatest prophecy in the Bible. And he finds the central idea that when Messiah arrives, Messiah shall be cut off, but but not for himself. Messiah will die selflessly so that others can live. The implications of what Paul has just studied are simple, but they're brilliant. The scales have fallen off his eyes, and he's realized that first, God is a covenant-keeping God. 
which is to say he will make a promise and he will keep it. Second, God is not a God who demands sacrifice from us, but he's the kind of God who provides a sacrifice. And adding those two ideas together, we can see that God will keep his promises even at risk for himself. And so with this realization, Paul comes to this conclusion that when the God who sits on the throne of the universe is a God who sacrifices himself rather than demands a sacrifice, when the God who sits on the throne of the universe makes promises and has a history of keeping them, even to his own demise, when this kind of God is the one who declares the universal pattern of how things ought to be and who ultimately will be responsible for making the world anew, then everything that happens, every cause of heartbreak, war, famine, cancer, disease, and everything in between will be fixed. It will be set right. And when we come to Philippians 4 verse 4, where he's got this mature faith that he's developed, we're not, we're not seeing Paul asking us for a stupid kind of Christianity where through those experiences you have to paint a smile on your face and pretend that everything's okay and say how happy you are. Rejoicing in the Lord always means that even when those things happen, if you know that the God in control is a God who hung himself on a cross, that he's a God who draws near to the suffering, that he's a God who will make it right, then you can rejoice. But don't take my word for it. My life has been relatively easy. I mean, yes, there's been some sad times, but I've never been chased out of my home. I've never had my life in jeopardy. I've never gone to bed hungry and not sure where my next meal is going to come from. But we have someone preaching to us here in Philippians 4, who can show you who's lived those realities. Not only can they show you from the scriptures that God is faithful, they can show you in their life that God has been faithful. Paul was the kind of guy that could go back to Genesis 22 and show you God's loving kindness, and he could go back to his last Tuesday to show you the same. So I want to look to finish up today by looking at who we're hearing from. What experiences does he have to share with us? And we'll pick it up in Philippians 4, verse 10. Philippians 4, verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My paraphrase of that is, I've learned that Christ is enough in abundance and with a full belly. And I've learned that Christ is enough when I'm hungry and I have no money for my next meal. Now, most of us here in this church won't swing between those two extremes. We probably live somewhere comfortably in the middle, and we're pretty happy there. Yes, petrol's the most expensive we've ever seen, it, but we're still filling up the car. We're not going without food unless it's to diet or part of some annoying intermittent fasting regime. Most of us can open up Amazon Prime and order freely what we want, and it may not be the best use of our money, but we can afford it. We just don't see those extremes that Paul is talking to us about. But he's saying in this passage, I've lived both of those, and I've learned to be content whatever happens. It's just really hard for us to identify with that, and it's really hard for us to, to see what he's saying. Like, what exactly, Paul, have you been through? We just have a hard time putting ourselves in your shoes. So 
Oops. Let's look through Paul's life. Paul, Hebrew of Hebrews, circumcised on the eighth day, zealous for the law, persecutor of the church, starts off with a pretty good life. He's intelligent, he's bold, he's aggressive. Those around him either look up to him or fear him. Saul of Tarsus, he's the man. But then Jesus is crucified, he rises from the dead, he rises to heaven. Before leaving, he commissions his disciples to spread the gospel, and this explosive movement known as the way breaks out, and Paul tries to stop it. But in the process, he's converted, and in the months to years that follow, his view of God changes dramatically. When it came time for Paul to preach his first sermon in Damascus, and we find this story in Acts 9. When it came time for his first sermon in Damascus, he comes back from Arabia, he's preaching, and his first sermon goes well. I mean, it went well. We're told in Acts 9, 22, that he literally confounded the Jews that he was preaching to, and he proved that Jesus was Messiah. He said, haven't you read Genesis 22? Haven't you read Daniel 9? Haven't you read all these other passages? It's so clear. And no one could argue with him. He confounded them. I mean, sometimes I'll get into debates, and it happens a bit more often than sometimes, but I'll get into debates, and mainly it's with my brothers, and sometimes I don't even know what I'm talking about, but I just come across like I know, so I can intimidate them, and they'll back off. And it, it, look, it works most of the time, and even when it doesn't, it still works because they're pretty easy to debate against. But th this, this is not that. Paul is talking to leaders of the field, of their field, and they have nothing to say. They're dumbfounded by what he's saying. And that, that's got to feel pretty good. It's his first sermon, and he hits it for six. It's easy then, isn't it? Rejoice in the Lord always. Amen. But here's what happens immediately after. Verse 23 of Acts 9. Paul's old friends, the ones that he'd done life with, the ones that he'd done 13 years of rabbi school with, the ones that he'd stayed up late talking about the law with, the ones that he'd worshipped with, his old church friends, those that he'd babysat for, his boys, it tells us that they tried to murder him. They were so angry about what had just happened that they tried to murder him. His best friends tried to kill him. And as high as he felt after giving his first sermon, it was immediately followed by the low of his friends after having a disagreement trying to kill him. How, hard, how easy is it then? Rejoice in the Lord always. So we continue in Acts 9 and we find that he escapes Damascus. He leaves his old friends behind. He gets on a horse and he travels to Jerusalem. But when he gets there, the Christians that he was aiming to befriend were afraid of him and wouldn't accept him. So he's been betrayed by his old friends. They've just tried to kill him. He tries to make new friends, but they won't accept him either. How lonely do you feel in that moment? Who do you turn to? Rejoice in the Lord always. But then he gets better. A man named Barnabas decides to befriend him. He invites him to the footy. He invites him over for dinner. He advocates on his behalf. He says, no, I, I believe Paul. I believe that he's saying what he means. He's genuine, and he vouches for him. His old friends have tried to kill him. His new team doesn't want him, but now he has a new friend. Rejoice in the Lord always. And it's not too long after this that Paul gets into another debate, and maybe he should stop getting into debates, but he does. And this time it's with the Greeks. And they're talking about how the world works. He's preaching Christ crucified to them. He's preaching Jesus. And they try to kill him as well. He's just made his only friend in the world, and yet again, someone is trying to murder him. Rejoice in the Lord always. Already Paul has had two attempts on his life, and we're still in the same chapter of him being converted. We're not even out of Acts chapter 9 yet. I don't think we often stop to realize the implications on the human level of what we're reading in those stories. Normally, I'll read through Acts 9 and I'll go, wow, that's great. Paul's being converted, praise God. 
Oh, someone tried to kill him, but he escaped. Great. Praise God. But I can't even begin to fathom what it's like to have someone try to kill me once, let alone twice. But this is Paul's life now, and it's going to happen over and over and over again. We could go on and on here through this book of Acts. We're still in chapter 9, and there are 19 more chapters detailing the exact same cycle, repeating itself. He goes from the mountaintop to the valley, the highest of highs to the lowest of lows, over and over again. But fortunately, there are two passages which summarize his life really concisely, and it really gets the point across. The first, if you can read that, is 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Actually start in verse 21. Here's what it says. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. How many beatings do you think you have to have before you lose count of how many beatings you've had? If I was beaten once or twice, I would certainly never forget that, but he's had countless beatings. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. How many times do you get shipwrecked before you stop taking boats places? For me, it's probably once. After the third time, I'm wearing a T-shirt that says I make boats sink so that other people can get off the boat when I'm getting on it. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to fall, and I am not indignant? And then the next passage in the next chapter of Second Corinthians. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul started life affluent, successful, comfortable, the next big thing, and he ends up counting all of that as rubbish and enduring the lowest of lows. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Is there any verse more taken out of context than Philippians 4.13? He's not saying that you can do literally whatever you want to do through Christ. You can't become a CEO of whatever company you want through Christ. You can't become a professional sportsman through Christ. If it was possible, then I would be playing footy. But some of us just don't have those skills. He's saying whatever situation you're in, good or bad, you can do it because Christ is there with you. He's saying... I learned to live as a wealthy man through Christ and for Christ. He's saying, when I had money, when I had friends, when I had the earthly comforts, it didn't corrupt me. I learned how to use those to spread the gospel. Money didn't become my God, but I used the money for my God. And then I learned to live in poverty. I learned to have nothing. And I learned how to do it without being in despair. He's saying contentment, joy, joy. is not related in any way to your circumstances. Whatever happens, whether you're comfortable or in pain, whether you're rich or poor, whether hungry or well-fed, whether homeless or sheltered, whether loved or neglected, whether healthy or diseased, 
Either way, your joy depends on Jesus. Either way, Jesus is still the covenant-keeping, self-sacrificial God of the universe. If I'm in wealth, then praise God. I'm going to trust him to use me to push the kingdom forward, to help the helpless, to glorify his name. If I'm in poverty, then I trust God to provide for me. And if, even if he doesn't and I die, then I trust God to wake me up again on the day that he sets the universe straight. It does not matter which takes place. God is still the same God. I've learned to be content in everything. Verse 6 of Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Verse 19, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I'll say rejoice. Thank you.